This is Farhan Azrali, the host of In Conversation, the podcast of Banyan Books and Sound. And I'm honored to be here with Buddhist teacher, author, poet, Norman Fisher, and author of the book, The World Could Be Otherwise, Imagination and the Bodhisattva Path. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Tell me a little bit about imagination and the importance of imagining a better world, especially in times like this. Well, I, in writing this book, I really did a lot of thinking and studying about what is the imagination after all. The way that we look at it now, right, the imagination is the opposite of reality. The reality is one thing and imagination is something else. But actually, if you consider uh, what the imagination is and how we've thought about it in our Western culture over the centuries, in fact, we make reality literally with our minds. Buddhism teaches this, and so does Western thought. And so nowadays does cognitive science. There's a world out there, but the shape of that world, the way we feel about it, the way we define it, the way it uh, strikes us in our lives, is a creation. We are creating a world, actually. So our imagination is not just something that produces fantasy. Our imagination also produces reality. So what gets me is that nowadays we're all sort of like buying into a very unproductive, even destructive use of the imagination. We're imagining this crappy world that, that is so destructive and painful to so many people. And so my argument is that we need spiritual practice to hone our imaginations, to open them up, to make them more pliable, more open. And we really need to create and see a different world. We need to see a world uh, of people who are Buddhas. We need to see a world in which, yes, there's definitely pain, but the pain is not doomsday. The pain is our challenge to be worked with for our own development and, and our opening. So I've, I'm, I'm really coming from a totally different place. It's not just imagine a pretty world so that you can feel better or imagine a pretty world so you can work toward it. It's realized that you are already imagining a world. The world that you live in now, you are already imagining. Take on that imagination and open it up. That's what I'm talking about. So you've, you've been a Buddhist teacher for a long time, long time teacher and student. You also just did a, a three month long retreat. I imagine you have a lot of experience in use of the imagination and the impact that it has in, in our perception and also our reality. Can you tell us a little bit about your own experience with with the use of the imagination in a really productive way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, when you think about our great religions, not only Buddhism, but any, any great religion, any religion that has you know, a long tradition behind it, actually, it's a way that people have been trying to work with the imagination to expand the heart, right? So, because I've been practicing Buddhism a long time, the way I see the world, the way I am in the world, comes from my experience as a Buddhist practitioner and as a student of the teachings and as someone who's contemplated the teachings, not only in my own mind, but in interaction with lots and lots of people over many, many years. So I actually live, live in a world that's a, a spiritual world. I actually live in a world in which everything that happens is part of my practice. I don't go on a retreat and practice and then come back to a crazy world that I'm trying to escape from. It's all my practice. The whole world is a world that I'm imagining. It's a world that I'm living in with my whole heart and everything is workable. So you can live in that world very easily. So somebody joked, not only could the world be otherwise, the world is otherwise when you make it otherwise. You don't, you don't have to dream about an, another world. This world already, when you apply your imagination through your practice. So in other words, it's not a matter of just, oh, close your eyes and pretend. It's a matter of, you know, you practice, you work at this. You, you do your meditation practice. The structure of the book is mostly about the six paramitas, six practices that are really thoroughgoing practices that you do every day, all day long throughout your life. 
that little by little transform your world imaginatively. So you practice generosity, you practice ethical conduct, you practice joyful energy, you practice patience, you practice meditation, you practice wisdom. These are like everyday practices in the way you see things and the way you interact with people in the way you work with your own mind and heart. You're working at this all the time. This is, this is your project. This is your life. This is the way you live. And when you live like that, you're actually living in a different world. And, and it doesn't mean that you don't have to save this world politically and socially and ecologically. It doesn't mean that that's no, no longer relevant. It just means that that's part of your challenge. That's part of your spiritual path. path. That's part of your imaginative life. So what would it look like to practice generosity and ethics and joyous effort in context of the political realm or social justice or in context of the environment? What would that look like in terms of an everyday practice? Well, it, it, what it would look like is uh, being real clear in your own mind that the goal here is compassion, that everybody is to be cared for everybody is to be taken care of because everybody is worthy. Everybody is worthy of respect and everybody's a Buddha. Everybody's a, every human being is a dignified, wonderful person, right? Even including your enemies. So when you find yourself shrieking at your enemies because they're idiots and they're all doing it all wrong and you are doing it right, whoa, stop yourself right there and realize you've been spun around into the very bad imagination world that is making us all crazy. No, your enemies are worthy people. There's a reason why they think what they think. There's a reason why they're doing what they're doing. What is that reason? So you have to think about that. You have to, and you have to ask them, like, why do you believe that? Why, why, if you, if you want to do something that to me seems like a bad idea, why do you want to do it? What's, what's, what's in it for you? What it, so you're really talking to people. You're listening to people. You're taking your enemies seriously. You still stand up for what's compassionate, but you're maybe a little bit more humble about it and maybe a little bit more careful about it and maybe a little bit more loving in all your actions and all your words. So you can take a person that you disagree with and that person could be your real, real antagonist. You can take that same person and still disagree with them and they can be your friend. You can have loving relations within your disagreement. And when that becomes the case, then you can do something. So, in other words, your, your, your view of what has to happen politically and socially may not change at all, but your whole approach to how you work with that and how you deal with that and how you deal with everybody you come into contact with around that can be quite different. Yes, that's a, a very interesting um, way of approaching it in the sense of... Um, approaching it from the foundation of compassion. I mean, I'm sure if um, everyone had a more compassionate heart, we would relate to each other so much more differently than we That's Right, we would not have the problems we have if people were really compassionate. And compassion is a deep thing. It's not just, I care about you. It's more than that. Through the effort of practicing religious life, as deeply as you can, as, with as much commitment as you can. You actually come to the place where you see an identity with others. So my compassion for you isn't just, I'm a nice guy, you know, I, I care I'm about you. It's that I realize, who am I really? You know, who am I actually, truly and really? And, and the more I appreciate who I actually am, truly and really, the more I see that I am really completely you. I can't be me unless you're you. That's really true, you know. You can't be you unless your parents are your parents, your friends are your friends, the world is the world. That's how come you're you. Without all that, you're not you. Really and truly, you are everyone else. So when you realize that, compassion is, is just a natural thing. You can't really hurt anybody. You can't really defend yourself or protect yourself and lash out at someone else. You can't do that. So compassion really is more than a good feeling. It's really a, a very firm sense of identity based on experience and insight that you know we are non-different from each other. We are totally dependent on each other. This whole world is like one organism, one being. So the fact that we kill each other, the fact that we shriek at each other, 
the fact that we're choking off the planet with our needs and our desires is just total lunacy. You can't do that. You can't do it. And so you stop doing it. You stop doing it. And you understand completely why we have done it. But you don't do it anymore. You don't live like that anymore. The world becomes different for you immediately. This um, truth of interdependence or interbeing, as some teachers call it, is this the wisdom that's referred to when you talk about the six perfections or six paramitas? Exactly. That's the wisdom. And, and, and it's a very uh, visceral, heartfelt, body-based, breath-based wisdom. It's not just the idea of it. It's feeling it in your body. Feeling, feeling it in your breath through the cultivation of your practice. So spiritual practice is really meant to be, at its depth, a total transformation of the imagination, of the heart, of this way of thinking, of the mind. And so uh, if you practice the six paramitas and you practice, you give yourself to your practice, you say, that's what I'm doing. I'm a bodhisattva. I, I'm just in disguise as Farah with whatever it else and <laughs> whatever anybody thinks I'm doing that's my disguise you know that that's everybody needs a story that's my story but the truth is I'm really a bodhisattva what I'm really about is saving all beings and, and becoming a Buddha that's what I'm really doing and everything in my life is really in the service of that so through the imagination you really flip around what you who you think you are and what you think you're doing and then the world really is otherwise for you and the more of us who are committed to that way of being and looking at things there are, the better the world's gonna be. So you've mentioned the word bodhisattva and um, you've mentioned you know, a being who's, who's dedicated to serving all others and dedicated to becoming a Buddha. Is there anything else that people who might not be familiar with that term or anything else that you can elaborate on about what it means to view ourselves as bodhisattva and the path of the bodhisattva no that's that's it just to to uh i think you you start by taking taking stock of your life and you i think everybody's got a vision right Every, everybody no matter how much people haven't thought have not thought about it everybody's got a vision a life image that's a product of their imagination so maybe you start there. Maybe you say, so what is my life vision? What do I think I'm doing? Who do I think I am? And what do I think I'm doing with this life? If this life is a precious gift that I've been given, and it's pretty brief, what am I doing with it? What's my mission plan? And, and if your answer is, well, I don't really know. I mean, I'm just trying to earn a living, just trying to get by. I'd like to have whatever, you know, a nice house, maybe, I don't know. I'd like to have a family, or if you have a family, I'd like my children to be safe. All that is good, but is that really enough for you as a human being? You have such a vast imagination and such a big heart, and you're so smart. Is that enough for you? No, that's not enough for you. Maybe you need a bigger mission plan. Maybe you need to say, well, yes, all that is true, but really, um, I would actually like to really understand my life. I would really like to understand what this human life is all about. And I would really like to be a loving person, really feel love, huge, big love. I would like to feel that. That's my aspiration. Well, that's a bodhisattva, to understand life and to love based on that understanding. That's what a bodhisattva is. So I really think that every human being actually is a bodhisattva. I think the human mind is constructed to have that desire and that goal. That's why we have these religions. Why, why did these religions ex exist in the first place? You know, they all say this kind of stuff, you know, oh, understand life, be loving, you know, be compassionate. They all say that. Mm -hmm. Why do they say that? They say that because that's a projection of our human hearts. That's what we are. That's what we all want. And, uh, and then, you know, we're, 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 we kind of get tired out and we, we don't have enough vision and we don't live that. So I think we need to kind of search a little bit inside and come up with a bigger, brighter, more ambitious mission. And then, we, and then we live that mission. And we can live it in the context of whatever it is we're doing. One, one of the concepts in the Bodhisattva path is that whatever human beings need, creatures, not only human beings, need for this life, a Bodhisattva provides it. So human beings need 
their laundry done. So bodhisattvas open up laundries. Human beings need to drive their car, so bodhisattvas are car mechanics. Human beings, some of them like having their nails done because they look really beautiful when they have their nails polished and nicely done. So bodhisattvas open up nail salons and take care of people's nails. Whatever they're doing, in other words, you don't have to be like Mother Teresa to be serving human beings and expressing your love for human beings. Whatever you do can be a, a path. So you can learn everything you need to know about human nature by being someone who works in a nail salon. All you have to do is talk to people and ask them, you know, more or less, who are you and what makes you happy and what's your life about and can I help you? If you do that and you uh, practice the Bodhisattva path, you do your meditation and you, you do your generosity practice and your, your ethical and so on and so on, little by little, you're on a path to be a Bodhisattva. Why don't we all have that bigger vision for our lives and take whatever it is we've got going in our lives and use it for that purpose? That's the argument of the book. Let's all do that. And it can be done. <laughs> do you think so? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I can't imagine um, not having a vision as big as that because I, I think humans are designed in that way. Right, they are. And when they don't try and have that vision, then they get all kind of problems. They get addicted to stuff. They get addicted to shopping. They get unhappy. They get depression. They have bad uh, love affairs. They have broken relationships. They're all kinds of problems happen to people when their vision for their lives isn't big enough. And we're seeing that everywhere around in the world, aren't we? Everywhere. Yes, it's very, very true. Yeah. Um, you know, that your answer was something that um, I'm not easily able to just... Um, spontaneously ask another question. So I'd like to come back to another one of the paramitas that you mentioned, which is generosity. Um, are there different types of generosity? It, um, what are the ways of practicing generosity that are maybe different from how we think of generosity? Yes, well, one of the things, so these six practices are traditional Buddhist practices. I, I didn't make them up. They are the, tradi the six traditional practices that define the Bodhisattva path. But what I tried to do in the book was basically uh, digest, having digested the traditional teachings, I was trying to be imaginative and say, uh, let's improvise. Let's improvise. What is generosity? How could we practice it? So I always invite the reader at the end of each chapter to make up their own practices and really see how they can be creative with all these things. So generosity, uh, I think we understand the word and we understand the basic idea of generosity. But another way of looking at it that maybe we, we're not so used to is to recognize the inherent generosity in life itself. Like now it's spring, you know, and around here, all the plants are just growing. They're just growing like mad. They just can't stop. You know, why, why are they doing that? You know, why, why do plants, when the weather warms up and the days are longer, why do they just want to grow and grow and grow? It's, it's a kind of act of super abundant generosity. There's so much abundance. There's so much love there that they just want to go. You know, they just want to go forth and they just want to do more and more and more. You can't stop them. You know, even when they're invading your driveway and all your, the weeds are coming all over your garden, you can't stop them because they just, are full of generosity, full of forward moving life. So every day when you get up in the morning, it's like, wow, you know, how did you, how did that happen? You, you went to bed, you totally lost consciousness completely. You didn't, had no idea what was going on. Why don't you wake up in the morning and forget who you were yesterday? Why don't you wake up in the morning and like think you're somebody else? Or why wake up at all? Why did you wake up at all? It's because life is so generous and so wonderful that you woke up in the morning, rested and full of energy, and you, and you thought you were the same person you were the day before. So you could have, you wouldn't be bewildered, right? You'd have some continuity. You'd be able to kind of pick up the thread from yesterday. What a, what a wonderful thing. That's life's generosity. That's the generosity of evolution 
making your mind capable of that kind of unbelievable total stop and starting up again without losing a beat. That's the generosity of consciousness, the generosity of life. Well, imagine if you saw that all the time and you were looking for that. Everywhere you looked, you were amazed by the generosity. Like, I, I live far away from town and I drive on the highway. And I think to myself, wonderful thing, these people made this highway here. It's so easy for me to drive on that highway in a car that other people made for me. It's amazing the generosity that graces every single day of our lives. What if you looked for that? What if you, were, what if you trained your mind to see that? Then would you be driving down the highway thinking, oh, no, you know, I don't want to be going to this appointment, I'm, or I'm late, or I, oh, I, I, didn't, I don't feel good, or... Would you be thinking that? No, you'd be thinking, wow, what a generous moment this is to be living. So in other words, you can train yourself to see the generosity all around you all the time and, and have a lot of gratitude. I would imagine with a mindset like that, it would make us much more reverent of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I want to be really clear here and not fool you or anybody else. I'm not saying that you, me, or anybody else is going to be enraptured every minute, right, by the generosity of everything. I mean, theoretically, we should be, we could be, right? But actually, we won't be, let's be honest. Actually, we'll be complaining and we'll be, you know, this and that. But if we have trained ourselves repeatedly, right, in this practice of seeing that generosity, we won't go very far down the road of crabbiness before we realize, geez, why would I want to be doing that to myself? I don't need to be crabby right now. Really and truly, it's not helping. Let me remember my practice of generosity. Let me remember my practice of gratitude. And you can actually remember it. You, you can act, when you've trained in it. So this, is, this takes discipline and training. It's not just enthusiasm. It's a certain amount of discipline and training. But when you have that discipline and training under your belt, even though you're a normal person and you're crabby sometimes, this, that, and the other thing, it's bodhisattvas, I don't think, are some kind of saints. They're regular people. But when you train your mind, you don't go very far down the road of small-mindedness before your practice kicks in and you remind yourself that you're lucky to be alive. And then you bring yourself back. So that's, that's the way it goes. And this training and discipline you're talking about, I imagine you're speaking specifically about meditation and meditative practices that work specifically in training and cultivating certain qualities of the mind. Uh, yes, I mean, when we say meditation, we usually mean sitting meditation, you know, in silence, a special practice that we do at special times. And I do mean that, but that's only one of the six paramitas. It also means working with our mind and with our emotions all the time, in every encounter, in every perception, all day long. Now, to be sure, that kind of working with our mind and our emotions really, really depends on sitting practice. It depends on our reflection on the, on the teachings. It depends on good friends and community members who are also working on this, who support us. So we need a whole world of support to encourage us in this. But yes, it's a discipline that is basically meditation, but it's not just on the cushion, it's all the time. The six paramitas are, all, meditation is only one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you've spoken about generosity and meditation and a little bit about wisdom in terms of the insight that arises. Um, what about joyous effort or enthusiasm? What role does that play in why is it one of the perfections? Well, when you're talking about the six perfections, whatever one you're talking about, you always say, this is the most important one. And joyous effort really is the most important one. Because if you don't make effort, right, if you don't have effort with, with a little bit of zest to it, if it, you can't have just like dutiful effort. I mean, a certain, sometimes maybe that's the best effort you make. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to make a dutiful effort because I said I would. But 
joyful effort is something else. It's an effort that has vision behind it, that has enthusiasm behind it, and has some joy behind it. You realize, you know, this is the most fun thing there is to do. Actually, it's more fun to practice generosity and meditation and, uh, and patience and wisdom than anything else you can think of. Because everything else kind of like gets old, you use it up. But these things are inexhaustible. And, and, the, and the angles and, and, the, and the things you learn from every practice you do is so immense that you really want to do your practice. You just, even when you're down, oh, I don't feel like doing it, it's really a drag. But then you start doing it for one minute and immediately you remember, oh yeah, right, what was I thinking there? This is great. I'm really enthusiastic about this. So you start making that kind of zestful energy that buoys you up and keeps you going. So you really need that quality of energy in your practice. I think that we're conditioned, you know, from childhood to think of religion as a duty. You're supposed to be a good girl. You're supposed to go to church. You're supposed to whatever it is you're supposed to. And, uh, but, but actually, religious practice is not supposed to be a duty. What it's supposed to be is a joyful exercise of the imagination to create a world that is wonderful to live in. And when you remember that, as soon as you start making effort, this zestful energy comes up in you because of your training. It comes up in you and it buoys you up right away. And, and this is true for me. When I get down you know, in, in the mouth or something like that, I'm lucky in my case because before you know it, there's another retreat or another class or another Dharma meeting to go to. And as soon as I go to that Dharma meeting or meet that person or go to that class, I'm right away, the zestful energy is there. I become really enthusiastic right away. So you, you should do that too. Fill your calendar with so many things that you have to go to that are gonna buoy you up that as soon as you, as soon as you get low, you know, there's another thing to make you remember, oh wait, why am I doing that to myself? I don't have to do that. So that's the discipline, is having those things in your life and committing yourself to them so that it buoys you up whenever you're down. You mentioned something very interesting that I'd like to ask a little more about. You mentioned other things get used up and the six perfections are inexhaustible. Can you speak a little bit more about what's meant by inexhaustible? Well, uh, the Bodhisattva path, I mean, the goal, right? Here's the goal. In Zen, we always chant the four vows. So this is our goal. Save all sentient beings. All of them. All beings. Save them all. Uh, second, uh, enter all Dharma gates. Uh, every practice that could ever be imagined, do it. The third, Overcome all defilements. Any way that your mind is uh, dim and dull and confused, overcome every single aspect of that. And the fourth one is become nothing more than the way of the Buddha. So there's nothing left of your life but just the Buddha way. Those are the four bodhisattva vows that we take all the time in Zen. Well, what do you think the chances are of anybody completing those four vows in one human lifetime. Zero. <laughs> How about two lifetimes or three or five? Also zero. You actually need an infinite number of lifetimes to complete this job because there's an infinite number of beings and an infinite number of Dharma gates and an infinite number of defilements and to become the Buddha way entirely is an infinite path. So there's no end. There's no end. And so it's wonderful. You're thinking, no matter how much I do, there's always, more. I've hardly even started. There's always, there's always more to do. It's so wonderful to think that this is inexhaustible. And my whole life through, I'll never wear it out. I'll never use it up. It can't be boring. Everything else, you know, is easily used up. You get tired of it, you know. You do, I mean, there are a lot of wonderful things to be done, for sure. But any of them eventually, you know, you get worn out. The thing about the Bodhisattva path, for example, that is fabulous, is that part of the Bodhisattva path is to die. At the end of your life, it's your practice to die. So you, so that's part of your practice, is to fully enter as a Bodhisattva, joyfully, this ending of this life. So everything else you do, death is bad news. But in the Bodhisattva path, 
death is part of the process. It's an infinite process. So you die again and again and again, and you keep practicing as a bodhisattva. So it's wonderful. You can grow very, very old and totally feeble, and you can be a total wreck and lose your mind, and you can't think of your name and everything like that, and you're still on the bodhisattva path. You're still doing it. You're still, and if you're well trained enough, I, I believe it. I think that even when you don't even know your own name and you're falling down, you're still on the path. You're still studying and trying to understand and trying to love. What is this life as a very, very old person who can't even think straight? What is it? And how can I be loving even now? And how can I die into full love without anything left over? How can I do that? So that's, Bodhisattva path is pretty great, you got to admit. Yes, I absolutely will admit it's it's grand and extraordinary beyond. Um, and we can do it. We can do it. Just us, or it's unbelievable that just ordinary people like you and me, we can actually do this. That's the that's the best part about it. Bodhisattvas are everywhere you look, because everyone already is a bodhisattva, and the only thing we have to do is realize that and start acting like it because we already are on that path why because we're human beings that's what human being is a bodhisattva so you will be in vancouver soon to talk a little bit about the book and share it with others what is your greatest aspiration for for how it will be received and what it will inspire well this might sound funny but I don't have any aspiration at all for any of that. Um, I have a lot of faith in uh, the Bodhisattva path, and I have a lot of faith in people's goodness. So whether or not this book uh, does any good for anybody, I have no idea. But I'm enthusiastic to talk to people and meet people and learn from them. And this book is my excuse. That's how I'm gonna go. If I walked into Banyan and I a bookstore and I said, would you bring 50 or 60 people here so that I could talk to them about the Bodhisattva path? No, it would never happen. So I had to write a book <laughs> in order for me to have that wonderful experience. So I'm going to go around and, and meet a lot of people. And, and I hope, I'm hoping that I can restrain myself from talking too much so that I can hear from people. I, I would hope that most of my time at Banyan and every place that I'm going to go with the book will be spent listening to people and interacting with people because that's the best thing. I want to learn people what people's hearts are because every person is an inexhaustible storehouse of wisdom and I want to learn from everybody. So I hope the book will be helpful, but I, I don't know. What's really helpful is when people practice. Books are not that helpful, actually. So if the book makes you think, I should practice, then that's good. But you don't need the book to have that idea. It's been so inspiring and insightful and um, so wonderful to be with you through the miracle of technology and be able to speak with you about this book and the imagination and the perfections. and. One thing that I 100% concur with you is I feel that when I hear the truth, it, it never gets old or tiring. It, it's, always, it's always resonant in a very alive way. Wonderful. Well, well, so are you. So are you. So it, it's always wonderful to talk with you. Thank you very much for uh, interviewing me in, in such a nice way. I